Good morning. This morning we're reading 1 Thessalonians 3. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass, and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith? Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. These are the words of our Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. You guys doing well? Outstanding. Good to have you with us on this uh, national holiday weekend. <laughs> Super Bowl Sunday. How many didn't even know it was Super Bowl Sunday? Show of hands. Show of hands. Okay. How many don't really even care? Oh, even more. <laughs> oh, that, that breaks my heart. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Good to have you with us. We got about 70 of our leaders in a meeting right now. We do a leadership meetings Every second Sunday, they have breakfast together, they get trained, they talk over what they're doing and who they are, and uh, it's primarily small group leaders, so it's good to have them in the back room there doing that. If you want to be a part of that, uh, you can join our monthly meetings and, and learn a little bit more about that. Also, you can go through our DB Life class, and then there's also a DB Leadership class that we offer here at Desert Breeze. This is our first Thessalonians teaching series, Hope in a Hostile World. I also want to welcome those of you that are on YouTube Live right now. Thank you for joining us. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're looking at verses 1 through 13. We're talking about marks of a healthy faith. And so I mentioned Super Bowl Sunday, and let me just say this, that the world defines greatness different uh, from God. Would you agree with that? Yeah, no doubt about it. One of the most important things on many people's mind, it's certainly not on my mind, and it's probably not on your mind either, but on most, or on many people's mind, is will Taylor Swift make it back from her Tokyo concert on Saturday night in time to watch her boyfriend, Travis Kelsey, play in the Super Bowl? He plays for the Kansas City Chiefs. Most of us say, who cares? Okay, I gotcha, I gotcha. And so, to be the greatest pop star in the world and to be an NFL player is greatness in the eyes of the world. In fact, I heard this, Travis Kelsey's brother Jason said, this is what he said, I quote, immensely talented Taylor Swift is an unbelievable role model for young women. I would agree, unbelievable, okay? which unlikely to be true is what that word means. So, uh, no, that's, that's insane. That's obviously showing us the values of this world as opposed to the values of God. So if you want to understand what God's, how God defines greatness, you just got to look at the Bible and look specifically at Matthew uh, chapter 18 and Matthew chapter 22. 18 says this. In fact, the disciples had come to Jesus and asked Him the question, who's the greatest? greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and he said, unless you become like a little child, you humble yourself, you turn from sin and put your faith in men, he said, bingo, that's greatness. That's greatness. Turning from sin, put your faith in 
him. Humble yourself is what he said. He also defines greatness, and it's through the great commandment. He said, greatness is defined like this, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, and so that's, that's within the reach of every person on the planet. In fact, it's interesting in Matthew 18, it actually says this. He goes on to say, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, anybody remember how the rest of that goes? It'd be better off, they'd be better off to have a millstone tied around their neck and thrown into a deep sea. So what awaits those who have a platform of success and they're using it for their own gain and leading people astray? It doesn't look good for them as the Bible defines greatness. So take a look at your sermon notes here. Let, let me bring you up to speed with where we are in this series thus far. If we are going to have hope in a hostile world, that's the world we live in, we need to be a participant in a healthy church. That was chapter one, week one of this teaching series with healthy leaders. That was last weekend, chapter two, so that we can grow a healthy faith. That's this weekend, a faith. That's, that's greatness. Put your faith, turn from sin, put your faith in Christ Jesus, and that's what greatness is defined in Scripture. That's who's great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, let's start with the end in mind, and look at, look at your notes here. And what I mean by that, the end in mind, this is the very end of our text that we just read. This is where he's headed with his faith. This is the fruit of our faith, of a healthy faith. The marks of a healthy faith, that is the fruit of a healthy faith, are increased in abounding love for others and being so happy in Christ. I'm defining that as holiness. So because he also says not only increased abounding love for others, but established in holiness. So I'm defining holiness as being so happy in Christ that sin loses its appeal, that is, its deception, and suffering loses its effect, its disillusionment. That's based on verses 11 and 13. That's the very last three verses of our text. So let me, let me ex explain that just a little bit. So the marks of a healthy faith, so if you really have a healthy faith, this is what it's going to look like. This is the fruit of it in your life. Uh, you're going to have increased over time as you walk in vital union and communion with Christ, you're going to have increased and abounding. The word abounding literally means overflowing, like a river overflowing its banks, abounding love for others. First John 4, 7, and 8 grew up in the church. We sang a song based on this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and he who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. So if there's anything that you should have in your life as a result of your faith in Christ Jesus, it should be increased and abounding love. That's, that's why he finishes this section talking about marks of a healthy faith in that. But he also talks about this idea of established in holiness. I think there's a lot of confusion when it comes to holiness. I put the verse down in 1 Peter 1, verses 15 and 16, where the, the apostle Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, he's quoting from the Old Testament where God says, be holy because I'm holy. Now, that's not the demands of a drill sergeant, a military drill sergeant. This is a loving Father inviting us to a life of wholeness and happiness unlike you've ever known. So when God says, be holy because I'm holy, that's an invitation to wholeness and happiness, to a life of wholeness and happiness unlike you've ever known. I mean, He's contending for our greatness. That's, we'll talk more about this idea of holiness or sanctification next week because that's the next chapter. But, but that's being so happy in Christ that sin loses its appeal, deception and suffering loses its effect, disillusionment. That's verses, three, or verses 11 through 13. Now, that's the fruit. What's the root? Well, that's where we're going to study. That's the rest of the, the text, the text that precedes that. So three questions we're looking at here. What is a healthy faith? We'll define that. Why do people defect from the faith? Kind of made that clear in that opening uh, part, but we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit deeper. And how can I have a healthy faith? How can I have a healthy faith? So those are the three questions we're going to deal with. Would you bow your heads with me? Just take a moment. Take a deep breath. Inhale. Exhale. Sometimes we just have to quiet ourselves. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Just take a moment. Think about who we're interacting with. 
Open your heart to him this morning as we study his word. So, Father, we are delighted to be here today. We pray that the staggering immensity of your love for us would chase away all the fears in our life. Just take a moment. If you have any worry, any fear, any anxiety, just just tell him about it right now. Just take a moment. God, this is what I'm struggling with. This is what I'm trying to work through. Lord, I need your, your peace, your love to chase away those fears. And Lord, as we, as we learn and live what it means, what it, what it means, why, why we, we need a healthy faith, what it means to have a f- healthy faith, why we need to have this healthy faith, why do people defect from the faith, and, and how can we have a healthy faith, Lord? As we study that this morning, those questions, as we answer those questions based on your word, Give us an increased and abounding love for others, establishing us in your holiness so that we are so happy, contented, satisfied in you that we are not overtaken by the deceitfulness of sin or overwhelmed by the disillusionment of suffering, living our lives totally for your glory. In Jesus' beautiful name, and everyone said, amen. So what is a healthy faith? If your Bibles are open there, you can follow along. The first two verses of chapter 3, therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. Let me bring you up to speed in the story thus far. As you guys well know, the missionary team of Paul, which included Silas and young Timothy, young pastor Timothy, they head into this city called Thessalonica. They proclaim the gospel for about three to four weekends in the synagogue. There's a revival that breaks, a, break, breaks out. Many people come to faith, but there's also a riot that breaks out against them from the religious leaders because they're extremely jealous of what they're doing. And so they run his, uh, his team out of town, uh, Paul's team, run them out of town, and they begin to persecute the church there, uh, that young, believing, new believers church in Thessalonica. And so, as Paul is going with his missionary team to other cities, he's concerned about these young believers. Are they going to be able to endure the the hostility of the world, having a newfound faith in Jesus Christ. So he sends Timothy back to check on him, and then Timothy comes back to him and reports to him, and this is the letter that he's writing, and this is what he's saying. Therefore, when we couldn't, could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ. And notice what he says here, to establish and exhort you in your faith. The word establish means strengthen And the word exhort means to encourage. So here's what you need to have in your life. If you're going to have hope in a hostile world, you need to be around people that help you to be strengthened and encouraged in your faith. So that would be weekend services. But in particular, also, you need to hang out with people. You need to be involved in a small group. That those people in your small group are encouraging you. They're strengthening you. And they're exhorting, they're encouraging you in your faith. If your small group's not doing that, go find another small group. I'll give you the permission to do that, okay? And then report that small group to Pastor Mark, and he'll come over and see what's going on in that small group, okay? We'll get that small group, you know, realigned to what they need to be doing. That's what they're doing right now in their meeting as they work through what their uh, responsibilities are and how to create a healthy environment where people's faith is strengthened and encouraged. Now, let me give you some, uh, really a definition of a healthy faith here, and it's your first fill in the blank. Faith is not a feeling, a force, or a formula. Sometimes you hear it taught by TV evangelists like it's one of those three things, but it's not. It's fellowship, friendship with Christ. That's what it's all about. This is the best part of the Christian life right there. Fellowship, friendship with Christ. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You really only have two choices. It's either eternal life or you're going to perish. And the only way you can keep from perishing is by putting your faith in, in Jesus. And so the Father sacrificed what he loved most so that we could experience intimacy with him. That is amazing. I love that. So, so what is this eternal life? Well, he defines it for us in John 17, 3. 
So, so we put our faith in Christ. We have eternal life. Uh, John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The word know there is not just facts, having facts about God. It's friendship and fellowship with God. It's more than information about God. It's intimacy with God. That's what he means by that word. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So that's the essence of when we put our faith in him, it's about fellowship, friendship with Christ Jesus. Now here's the foundation of it. Foundation of this friendship is the person and work of Jesus Christ. I hear people say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Okay, what, what is it that you believe about Jesus? Who is Jesus? What did he come to do? See, that would be what we need to know more than anything. That's the content of our faith. You need to comprehend this and understand this. So the foundation of this friendship is the person that is, he's God in flesh. This is what separates Christianity from every major cult and religion of our world today. They deny the deity of Christ. So God came from heaven to earth through Jesus Christ, and then his work, cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. We're all guilty of sin. We're separated from God. We're out of friendship and fellowship with God. That's a fact. And we're born into that, so we need to be born again. So it doesn't stop there. So the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, so it's a gift. We have this gift through Jesus Christ. It tells us in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4, by grace are you saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. So this is another thing that separates Christianity from all the major cults and religions of our world today. First of all, they deny the deity of Christ. Secondly, all the major cults and religions, it's a works righteousness. You achieve it, and the good are in, the bad are out. In Christianity, the humble are in, the proud are out. All you need is need. You receive it. You don't achieve it. You receive it by grace through faith in Christ. He died in your place for your sins. So the gospel is the good news that God has reconciled us to himself by sending his son to die in our place for our sins and all who repent and believe in him have everlasting life. Enter into this friendship relationship with God. And let me just say, that is out of this world. There's nothing better than that. It is life's most satisfying reality is to know the true and living God, to interact with Him, to know Him, and to experience Him. That is, it's out of this world. So there's three parts of this faith. Faith involves comprehension, has to do with your head, it's an intellect, conviction, that's your heart, and then commitment, that's your hands. So comprehension, conviction, commitment. So when you think of Here's an easy way to remember it. Just think, when I think of faith, head, heart, hands. Hands have to do with your actions. Head has to do with your intellect. Heart has to do, you could say maybe with your emotions, but your desires, your dis, you know, kind of your decisions. And so I'm going to walk you through this so that you understand this. Now, James, half-brother of Jesus, talks about this, and he says, faith without works is dead. And when you study through that, you'll see all three of these as he explains that in James chapter 2. In fact, he says something quite interesting there. James chapter 2, verse 19, he says, oh, you believe that God is one? Hmm, you do well. Even demons believe and shudder. So he's saying, hey, uh, good job. You've got to the level of a demon if all you have is comprehension and conviction. <laughs> Welcome to the demon club. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, you have comprehension. Okay, so you know the person and work of Christ, and it, and it stirs you, but you haven't made a commitment yet, then you haven't, that's not, that's not faith. You're not actually following him. You haven't committed your life to him. Now, so if, if this is true, then you ought to be able to see it in the church in Thessalonica who committed their life to Christ, and you can. If you've got your Bibles open, turn back to chapter 1, and I'm going to show you all three of these um, part of this, kind of part of the process of the faith development in our life. It's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 6. Now, let me read it. If you don't have your Bibles, you can listen and see if you can spot the, the head, heart, hands, the comprehension, the conviction, and the commitment. Comprehension means that there's, a, there's content to our faith. 
There's, a, there's something that we must believe, and then it's, it moves your heart, and then you make a commitment to it. So listen to what he says here. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, so there's the comprehension, that's the head part, it's intellectual. By the way, I hear people say, you know, faith is just a blind leap into a dark chasm. Uh, wrong. It's a step into the light. It's intellectual. This is what he's saying. And so, because our gospel came to you not only in word, that's comprehension head, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. There's the conviction. There's the heart. So, they heard the gospel message, and it stirred them in their heart. Now, see if you can see the next part of this where it is commitment, where it begins to change their lives. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and the Lord. There it is. So there's their actions, their hands, their commitment. For you received the word in much affliction. This was even in the midst of suffering with joy of the Holy Spirit. So they're in affliction, they've committed their life to Christ, they're experiencing affliction, but God is giving them through the Holy Spirit joy to endure that. If you wanna see all three of these uh, aspects of faith, you can also read what is known as the faith chapter in the Bible. Anybody know what the faith chapter is? Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11. Okay, did you guys know that over here? Okay, you just didn't answer as quick as they did over here, did they? They're like all over it right here, this group right here. What, what about this group? You guys were on that too? You guys were all over that? Okay, Hebrews 11, great, great chapter. It's the hall of faith. So faith development is the way in which we do anything. So how do, how do you find a surgeon? How do you choose a spouse? How do you find an auto mechanic for your car? How do you hire a new key member to your team? How do you do these things? Essentially, they're all the same in the faith development process. They're going to involve comprehension, conviction, commitment, head, heart, hands. Say you have to have surgery. You need to find a doctor. My wife needed this a few years ago. She needed gallbladder surgery. Uh, I needed this uh, within the last, <laughs> this last year, as many of you know. I had five herniated discs, and uh, so I'm like, okay, I think I could use some help here. And so the first, first of all, there's a rational process, comprehension, head. You get recommendations uh, from people you trust, and you sift through the evidence. And, and then secondly, as you reason to a point of probability beyond a reasonable doubt that this is the right doctor for you, that would be the next stage. That's that conviction. Okay, this is the doctor I'm going to go for, which, by the way, when my wife decided the doctor she was going to go to, she talked with some folks in our church that are part of the... Uh, part of the medical industry, and they, she mentioned to them the doctor she was going to, and they said, oh, he's got the highest infection rate. And my wife goes, oh, good, I'm going to go anyway. I don't care what you say. No, she didn't say that. Uh, she didn't say that at all. She goes, oh, I, gotta, I better get another doctor. So she went back to the rational part of, okay, I got to do some more research here. In fact, they recommended a few doctors that were even better for her. So the second part, you reason to a point of probability beyond a reasonable doubt that this is the right doctor for you. You are convinced that this is your best bet. So you reason to a point of probability beyond a reasonable doubt that this is the best doctor for you, but it takes commitment to lead to certainty. She would not know until she went under the knife. And, and so that's the third one. You have to make a commitment to have the surgery. That's the commitment, the hands. You make yourself vulnerable. You go under the knife. Faith hasn't completed itself until you make a commitment. And after you've done that, and you've put yourself in the hands of a surgeon or a mechanic or a fiance and actually marry, only after you've done that can you ever be certain if the person is trustworthy. I know it sounds a little crazy, but that's how it works. And then as time goes on, the certainty grows. This is the way in which people make decisions. Everyone would love to be able to reason to certainty. We'd all love to reason to certainty, but it doesn't work that way. This is the reason why some people never get married, because they want to reason to certainty and then make the commitment. They want to be absolutely sure. And uh, so, you, so the 
three stages. You can reason to a point of probability beyond a reasonable doubt, but then it takes commitment. Only commitment will lead to certainty. You've got to make the commitment. Now, there's a difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. The difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is not whether you have faith, but where you put your faith. Everyone on the planet is living by faith. Everyone on the planet is betting their life on something or someone. Knowing right from wrong or finding meaning in life is a faith process. It involves this process. Everyone's doing it. And as you, as you well know, if you attend Desert Breeze for any length of time, the Christian faith is historical, evidential, factual. You can reason to a point of probability beyond a reasonable doubt in the veracity and validity of who Christ is and what he came to do for you. But that will only take you the first two. That's comprehension and then conviction. You can be stirred emotionally, but you got to make a commitment. And when you make a commitment, you give your life to him, then you begin to see the reliability of that. You begin to see that he is indeed faithful. So faith is, is truth. Think about this. Faith is truth entering the head and igniting the heart and outworking through the hands. So you can reason to a point a probability that's the head beyond a reasonable doubt about the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's the heart, but it takes commitment to lead to certainty. That's your hands. Now, let me, let me explain something also to you. So when you think about faith, think about it like this. Faith is more than an agreement with facts in the head about the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's an appetite for God in the heart that exceeds all other appetites to the point that it changes every aspect of your life. If it doesn't do that, if it doesn't really change you in such a way that you want him more than you want anything else, then you really don't know him like you should know him. And so the more you understand him, I'm telling you, it will build an appetite in you that is greater than your appetite for anything else in this world. And uh, that's faith. So it's more than agreement with facts in the head. It's an appetite for God in the heart that exceeds all appetites. And this is what transforms every aspect of your life. He becomes, you begin to live for his glory. And so you love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then that puts everything else in its appropriate place in your life. This is what creates a lot of problems because we have greater appetite for any number of things more than Christ. And then everything else gets out of order. It's called disordered loves. It creates all kinds of problems in our lives. And so this is what, what faith is all about. Now, faith and worship kind of really go hand in hand in a lot of ways. So the foundation of faith, always keep this in mind, the foundation of faith is thinking. So if you're struggling with a lot of anxiety and anger and depression and despair, and you're looking at the circumstances of our, of our life, and you're looking at our nation, you're looking at all this stuff, and you're overwhelmed by that, it's because you're not thinking out the implications of your faith. So the foundation of faith, or you're not worshiping God. Worship is ascribing ultimate worth and value to God in such a way that it engages and energizes your whole being, your mind, emotions, and will. Comprehension, conviction, commitment. So faith and worship kind of go hand in hand. So I worship God every morning, and so I think out the implications in worship. Uh, which is reasoning. I reason out who Christ is and what he's done for me, what he's doing in my life, what he's planning for my life into the future. And, and so I, I think that out. That's why it says Romans, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing, hearing what? The word of God. So I, I'm thinking and reflecting on God's holy word. He's speaking to me. I'm communicating with him. I'm engaging him. He's energizing me as I'm talking to him and, and walking with him. And so I think out the implications. Faith is a foundation. That found, the foundation of faith is thinking out the implications of who Christ is and what he has done and is doing and will do in my life until it ignites my heart and works its way out into my hands, my actions. And sometimes, it's, some days it's harder than others. There's people in my life that I, I, I am having a hard time dealing with. And I'm, I just say, Lord, you're, you're bigger than my problems, or circumstances could be overwhelming. But then I start thinking out the implication, wait a minute, you're for me, you're not against me. When I realize who it is that walks through my day with me, woo, 
Game over. Lord, help me to cultivate that intimacy with you. Help me to walk that out. That's worship. That's faith. That's faith. Okay, enough, enough there. Let's talk about why do people defect from the faith. And I've seen a, a number of people defect from the faith in my lifetime growing up in the church. And so we defined for you what is a healthy faith. What, why do people defect from the faith? Number one, disillusion by, by the pain of suffering. I've seen a lot of people defect because of that. And, and it goes something like this. I, I've seen people do this. I've, they shake their fist at God. And they go, after all I did for you, I went to church, I read my Bible, I dropped money in the box, and, and this is what I get from you? Uh, time out, that's religion. You totally missed the whole, the big E on the I chart of Christianity, that it's all about Jesus, and he never promised you a painless problem for your life. We'll talk about that in a minute, but, but no, 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 you, you're, you were using God. You're using God. You're coming to Him to get from Him. You don't realize what you have in Him. Oh, my goodness, you're missing the best part of the Christian life. That's religion. That's not a relationship with God. And I've seen people do that. They're disillusioned by the pain of suffering. Look what he says in verses 3 and 4, that no one be moved by these afflictions. So he tells them about Christ. They commit their life to Christ. And then he says, hey, you're going to be afflicted. You're going to get the living daylights beat out of you. Are you still in? And let me just say that no matter what you face, he's still bigger. He's better than any afflictions you'll ever face. And that, that's the point that he's making, that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. Huh? Destined for this? I didn't know that. Yeah, we live in a fallen world. It's broken. Man has rebelled against God. All the sin and suffering that's prevalent in our current world is symptomatic of man's rebellion against God. That's why he's saying we're destined for this because this is what we brought onto ourselves. So you're going to experience some suffering. Oh, by the way, also you need to know that you put your faith in Christ, you got three enemies. You got your own sinful nature, you got the world's values. Oh, and you've got an enemy, the devil. We'll talk about him in a minute. He's coming after you, he's trying to take you down, and he's a liar. He says, for when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass, and just as you know. This is incredible faith of these people. They're newborn believers, and they're taking a beating. There's affliction, and yet they're standing strong, because what they have in Christ is is strong enough to endure the worst kind of hostility towards them. That is amazing. Now, C.S. Lewis talks about expectations. He says the important role of expectations, and this is what he said. Uh, I'll paraphrase it a bit. Let's just say that I was to take you into a room, and before I took you into this room, I said, this is a honeymoon suite, and you walk into the room and you go, mm, not quite what I expected. You know, it's not as plush and extravagant as you thought it would be. So, okay, okay, so let me just say, I take you into that very same room, but then before I take you into that room, I say, this is a jail cell. You walk in, you probably would say, ah, it doesn't look so bad, it looks pretty nice. So it's really about expectations. So if you have your expectations here, what you're expecting from God, and your life experiences comes in down here, down below that, what is this gap called? This is expectations, this is your life experiences. What is that gap called? It's called disappointment, okay? That's disillusionment. It's like, wow, uh, th th here's what I'm experiencing, and this is what I was expecting. So, so here's the key. So he's, he's laying it out in, in presenting Christ to them. He's saying, oh, by the way, you follow Jesus, you're going to get the living daylights beat out of you. This is what he's saying. He's promising this. That's part of the Christian life. What were you expecting? He, you you're going to, you're going to, the enemy is going to try to take you down. Values of this world are, are contrary to what, you, what we believe. Your own sinful nature, you're going to battle that. So you want to make sure that your expectations are consistent with God's promises. Would you agree with that? Okay, so here, let me tell you this. He never, ever, ever, in God's word, and Jesus never promised his disciples, and that promise goes to us also. He never promised us a painless or problem-free life. But this is what he promised us. He promised us his power, his presence, his, pre his, 
his peace, his providential care over our life no matter what goes down, that it will always be enough. Do you hear me? So what are you up against? What are you facing? He's bigger. I'm telling you. He's stronger. He is with you. He hasn't forgotten about you. That's why Jesus, the very last words he said to his disciples, before they're going to be running, scattering like a bunch of rats off of a sinking ship because he's going to be hanging on the cross. And he tells them this, I've told you these things before they happen so that when they happen in me, you'll have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation. Take heart, I've overcome the world. It's powerful. Absolutely powerful. Remember the, the Red Sea illustration we talked about last week. So whatever you're up against, nation of Israel coming out of Egyptian bondage, they came up to the Red Sea. They've got the Egyptian army breathing down their neck. So God could have removed it or make a way through it. He made a way through it. So he will either remove whatever you're facing or he'll make a way through it. Either way, you can trust his perfect love, infinite wisdom, and unlimited power working for you. That's it. That's what the Bible teaches. Very clear. So we become disillusioned by the pain of suffering. I probably spent way too much time on that because we're going to get to more solution later, but I just want to make sure you understood that. Don't be disillusioned by the pain of suffering, and don't be deceived by the pleasures of sin. Look what verse 5 says. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. The word tempted means to solicit to sin. Let me, let me say this before we get to the next point. If you think the pleasures of this world by living a life in disobedience to Christ will give you greater pleasure than the pleasure you find in Christ, you are dis, you are you're disillusioned, you are deceived, you're being duped by the enemy. And what I was trying to say is, you're delusional. <laughs> if you think, listen to me, everybody listen up. If you think there's greater pleasures in this world as opposed to that which is found in Christ Jesus, you're delusional. The tempter is working you through the billion-dollar industry of consumerism, commercialism, TV, movies, all of that stuff. It is craziness. You're delusional. This is what he's saying here. Now, look at this next part. If Satan can't get you to doubt God's existence, he'll get you to doubt God's goodness. And he does this by getting us to question God's commandments and character. Remember what he said to Adam and Eve in the garden? He said, did God really say that? So we start questioning his commandments. And so that's where I get that idea that if you think, see, his commandments come to us out of his perfect love and infinite wisdom. He wants us to flourish. And he's saying, this is how I want you to live. You live outside of this, you're not going to have the flourishing that I've, I've planned for your life. So we doubt that, and then we doubt his character. So after he said, did God really say, and then she kind of rambles through it and doesn't explain it perfectly, and then he says, well, God knows that if you eat of the tree, you're going to become like him. And so he begins to work on them with God's character, understanding the nature of God, and starting to doubt, well, he's holding out on me. He doesn't have my best interest in, in my life. I think I'll be happier if I pursue the things of this world as opposed to God. That's where it is. John 8, Satan is a liar, the father of lies. It tells us in Romans uh, 2, 4, says, it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. No, notice it doesn't say it's the anger or the judgment of God that leads to repentance. There's, there's some, I think, well-meaning brothers and sisters out there that want to talk about all the anger and judgment of God that that's going to somehow bring people to repentance. Actually, it doesn't. It's, it pushes a lot of people away, but it's the goodness of God. The word goodness here. It is an invitation to traitors like me and you to be his close friends. So we're traitors. This is what it's saying. We're traitors of God, and yet he's inviting us to be his friends. That's the goodness of God. 
the goodness of God. It's blood-bought. So his friendship, listen to me, his friendship is bigger than any pain of suffering and better than any pleasure of sin. That's a fact. So we gotta, we've got to learn how to tap into that. So how do we experience that in our life? And, and so we've got to learn. We did a whole series just talking about fighting for the faith, our beliefs. We spent the first three weeks talking about that. This is all part of that. How can I have a healthy faith? Look at verses uh, 6 through 10. This is Timothy's encouraging report. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith, so he's talking about they have a healthy faith, and love, their faith and love, and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. Boy, we're really encouraged because you have a healthy faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. In other words, man, this is we're really living because we see that you guys are standing fast in the Lord. You have this healthy faith. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God as, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. So they're not complete in their faith. They're still growing. But we want to come to you and supply what is lacking in your faith. Okay, here it is. It's not the size of your faith, but the object of your faith that matters most. So, so we're talking about how can we be strong in the faith? How can we have an unshakable faith in a world of hostility? And it, it's right here. It is not the size of your faith, but the object of your faith that matters most. Matthew 8, 26, you guys are probably familiar with the story of Jesus getting in the boat, he falls asleep, they head out towards in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, storm breaks out. These are tough dudes. I mean, these are tough guys, and they think they're going to die. So they're, they're freaking out, and they go over and wake up Jesus. Jesus, we're going to die. They think they're going to die. They've been out on the lake many times. Some of them are fishermen. They know the severity of the storm. And did you notice how he responds to them? It's found in Matthew 8, 26. He says, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Yeah, so, so somehow little faith and fear kind of go hand in hand is what he's saying. So he's just saying you have, you have little faith. You shouldn't have this fear in your life if you really had the faith that I want you to have. There's another interesting story found in Matthew 17. Jesus and his three disciples come off the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John. They come down to the bottom, and, and the disciples are stumbling around trying to cast a demon out of a, out of a little elept, epileptic boy who's seizing. His dad's freaking out and needing, please pray for my son. They're praying for him. They can't cast the demon out. They can't get rid of the demon. They can't heal the young guy. And Jesus comes down, and he's like, oh, come on, guys. And he actually says in that context, he says, faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. If, if you, any of you would have had just a mustard seed faith, you could have gotten it done, is really what he's saying. <laughs> in other words, they didn't seem like they had any faith, because you guys know what the size of a mustard seed is. It's pretty small. So he's making a point. It's, it's not... It's not the size of your faith, it's the object of your faith that matters. Now, Mark talks about this story and adds a, an, another detail to the story where Jesus says all things are possible to him who believes. And the father of this son who uh, has this demon yells out, maybe you're familiar with this, he says, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. So, so let me give you a quick analogy of what I think is happening here. You're hiking, maybe Grand Canyon or up on a mountain peak somewhere. You lose your footing, begin to fall off of a cliff. There's a branch certainly big enough to save you out the side of the cliff. If you have questions, doubts, and fears about the branch's ability to save you, but you reach out and grab it anyway, you will be saved. 
If you allow your questions, doubts, and fears to keep you from reaching out to the branch, you'll fall to your death. It's not the size of your faith. It's the object of your faith that saves you. So faith is not the absence of questions, doubts, and fears. It's bringing your questions, doubts, and fears to God. It's bringing them to God. It's clinging to Him. That's what that father's doing. I believe. Help my unbelief. God, help me stir up faith within me. I'm desperate. I'm clinging to you. I'm falling off of the cliff. I almost fell right then. And I'm, I'm falling off the stage, and nobody will help me in desert breeze. But you can help me. You know, so that's what he's doing. Faith is not a denial of reality. The Bible never denies reality. It's not the denial of reality. It's the declaration that God is bigger than whatever you're facing. That's it. And there's a whole book of, it's the largest book in the Bible. It's called the prayer book of the Bible, 150 chapters of raw emotion, bringing your prayers your questions, your doubts and fears to God, pouring it out to God. See, that's that commitment level. You've reasoned to a point of probability beyond a reasonable doubt in the validity and veracity of the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done for you, and now you're making that commitment. You're bringing all your questions, doubts, and fears to him. Oh, God, please help me. I need you. I trust in you. And I'm telling you, he will meet with you. He loves you. He will take care of you. And then your faith will begin to grow like crazy. You bring that to him, it will grow. It will grow. So, the more you get to know the object of your faith, the more your faith will be unshakable. Psalm 9, 9, and 10. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know His name. Anytime the Bible refers to the name of someone, it speaks of their character. Those who know His name will trust in him because he has never forsaken those who seek him. So those who know his name. I mean, he's just saying it matter of fact. Know his name, you'll trust in him. Get to know his character, you'll trust in him. How many by show of hands have, have met someone and that the more you get to know them, the less you trust them? Show of hands. Okay. That's not how it is with God. You spend time with God. You get to know God. By the way, Christian faith is not a technique to be mastered. It's a person to encounter and to engage with and to know and to walk and to uh, share your heart with, to talk to. He talks to you. It's a mutual giving and receiving of love and truth between you and God. And believe me, you bring your needs, your cares, your problems to Him. You cling to Him as you're falling over that cliff. He's strong enough. He will take care of you. That's, that is it. It tells us in Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. See, if your life is riddled with worry, failure, dysfunction, loneliness, and emptiness, it's because you have probably a domesticated view of God. You have a junior varsity God. And that, it, tells, it gives us language like in Ephesians 3.8, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Swim in the ocean of his unsearchable riches of what he has for you. Oh, my goodness. It's, it's out of this world. And, and if you're struggling, consider, and I think this is true of all of us to a greater or lesser degree, consider the possibility that your mental idea of Jesus is the tip of the iceberg. That's why it tells us in 1 Corinthians 2.9, listen to me, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor heart, no heart has imagined what he has in store for those who love him. Do you have any idea what he has in store for you? He loves you. He's going to take care of you. He's committed to you to the end. Man, that, and that's, that's the reality of this. And so the more you get to know him, the more you're going to Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. I mean, we should be walking in the victory of that and, and bringing Christ wherever we go. And somebody needs help or prayer, man, you lay hands on them. You pray for them. You expect God to work a miracle in their life. Listen, there is never a time when he's not working for you and in you, and he can work through you if you'll make yourself available to him. 
I had someone send me this quote this last week, said, expectation is the combustible fuel of, of faith. And basically, it's hope. Confident, dreadful expectation. God, I know you're up to something. I can't see it right now. I don't know what, what it is, but I know based on the authority of your word, you're up to some really, really good things in my life. And I'm going to live in the reality of that. And so, don't feel your way into your beliefs. Believe your way into your feelings. This is what I have to do regularly. This is what I do in my devotions. So Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope or our faith without wavering. How do we do that? Because we keep our eyes on Jesus, for he who promised is faithful. I love the quote by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis um, says this, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through it a couple times because see, I, maybe it was the crowd last night. I, I, you guys... I'm not saying that you guys are smarter than the crowd last night. I'm not going to say that. I would not say that. No, they're pretty smart. There were some that were here last night. You guys were here last night. And, um, and so um, I think it's just one of those hard quotes because it took me a while to get it too. Faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. So you've reasoned to a point of probability beyond a reasonable doubt that Jesus is who he said he is and came to do what he came to do. You got that, and you've committed to him. Now you're going to have to ride that out through your ups and downs of life. That's what he's saying. And you're going to cling to him regardless of the circumstances, people, things, your feelings. I mean, let's, I mean, let's face it. Aren't there times, a lot of times, maybe most of the time, you just don't feel like Jesus is anywhere to be found? Do you, would you guys agree with that? Okay, there's only like four of us that are being honest. I, I know you guys, there are times in your life that you just feel like, man, I feel like I'm talking to the ceiling. Where are you, God? What's going on? He still hears you because the Bible says that, not based on your feelings. So I, I want to kind of walk through this. This is what I, I typically do. So faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted. You're in. You're all in in spite of your changing moods. So I put this on your notes. Feelings have to, you have to keep your eyes, your feelings have to keep your eyes on your faith, and faith has to keep your eyes on the fact of God's Word. Uh, I, I came across this a number of years ago, and I found it helpful. Let me just see if I can walk you through it. And we're almost finished up here this morning, so this is an important part of, this is what I do. Feelings are fickle and dangerously misleading, and Scripture never points us to feelings for assurance. Our assurance ought to be based on the fact of Christ's finished work. Our feelings of assurance will come from maintaining faith in that finished work. So that's where we keep our eyes. In other words, feelings come from assurance, not assurance from feelings. So here's the analogy. Imagine three men walking in line along the top of a narrow city wall. The first in the line is named fact. So fact is here. This would be God's word. And the, the second would be faith. Faith would be directly behind him, faith. And then the third would be feeling. Feeling would be behind, would be behind the faith. You guys catching that? And so, because the wall is narrow, they need to pay careful attention to where they step. As long as feelings, feelings at the end of the, the line, as long as feelings' eyes are on faith and faith's eyes are on fact all do well. But the moment that faith, faith is in the middle of the two, faith turns around to check on feelings, both faith and feeling will fall off the wall. Let me say it again. Don't feel your way into your beliefs. Believe your way into your feelings. Think out the implications of your faith. Worship Him. As you worship Him, you're ascribing ultimate worth and value to God in such a way that it engages and energizes your whole being, your mind, emotion, will. This is what transforms us. And so it's, it, this is what, when overwhelming negative thoughts and feelings are triggered by people or things or circumstances, this is what I do. I must follow the trigger back to the root. Somewhere in that root is a lie and confront it with the truth of God's word. 
What I'm talking about here is known as emotional intelligence or mindfulness. You've got to be aware of, why am I so ticked off about that guy that just ran me off the road over there? Uh, you know, wh whatever it might be. Or where that person said something that just triggered something within me. So you start thinking about, what is, what's triggering that? And there's probably a lie behind that. John 8, 31 and 32 says, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Abide in my word and then you are really my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The opposite of that is also true. Lies will bring bondage to your life. You'll be mired in negative thoughts and emotions. But the truth brings freedom. Wait a minute, God's for me. He's not against me. He's going to see me through this. That's what we do. And so I have a whole arsenal of verses when, I, when I'm spending time with God. And that, part of why I say at the very beginning of our prayer, I just take a deep breath, slow down, be a little more mindful, think about what's going on in your heart. Allow God to speak to your heart this morning. So I've got these verses that when, I, when I'm in touch with my, I feel guilt over, you know, I have past guilt and shame, Romans 8, 1. There's therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. When I'm feeling lonely, Hebrews 13, 5 through 6, he said he would never leave me or forsake me. When I'm feeling anxious, Philippians 4, 6 through 8. When I'm struggling to make ends meet, Philippians 4, 19. When I've got bitterness, Hebrews 12, uh, 12 15. Now, since it is Super Bowl Sunday, let me give you one last illustration here, okay, uh, of this faith. I think this is a really great example of faith. How many know who Brock Purdy is? Brock Purdy. You guys know who he is? He's, he's, he's the quarterback for uh, 49ers, 49ers, and this is a quote from his um, coach, who is probably not a believer. I'm not his judge, but I don't think he is, just I can tell, but anyway. You read his lips on the sideline. Okay. <laughs> okay. I didn't have to say all that, and, and, and this is recorded. Welcome to Desert Breeze. Okay. Uh, this is what he said about Brock Purdy. This is what I love about Brock. By the way, uh, this is his response, Kyle Shanahan, on the criticism Brock Purdy receives from the media. He's just getting the living daylights beat out of him by the media, a lot of very negative things. And so this is what Kyle Shanahan said. This is what I love about Brock. Last pick in the draft two years ago, and they called that, they called him Mr. Irrelevant. Like, unlikely to ever play the game, and he's just back up and all of this. Well, he takes us to the conference championship game twice, and this Super Bowl in two years, getting talked about for MVP, and the dude, he, isn't, he doesn't have to work at not listening to it, that, that is the media, or trying to stay humble, or trying to not get caught up in how life is changing. You know why? He doesn't care. He really has a true foundation and knows who he is and who he wants to be. That is rare for any human He's a special player. Anybody know why? I saw an interview this last week, and they were going, why are you not stressed out? Are you stressed out about going in and playing for the Super Bowl this weekend? And this is what he said. My identity is not football. My identity is not found in football. It's found where? In Jesus Christ. That's faith. That's faith. And so if you're not rooting for Brock Purdy for the Super Bowl game today, you're probably not a Christian. Okay. Okay, I, I'm just kidding. Okay. You can root for whoever you want to root for. Well, thank you very much, Pastor Ray, for giving us permission to do that. Okay, so faith grows through spiritual disciplines, Holy Spirit, yep, and trials and temptations. It's in trials and temptations. So spiritual disciplines are what you do daily, Bible study, prayer, hang out, local church family, get plugged into a small group, hanging out with other Christians, and then you've got to be in touch with the Holy Spirit. You've got to have the Holy Spirit inside of you, and as you commit your life to Him, be sensitive to His voice and, and all of that. Next weekend, we're going to talk about live a life pleasing to God. First Thessalonians chapter 4, you can read ahead. I'm going to be talking about sex, work, and death. All right. There we go. I knew some of you would get excited about that. 
So uh, I'll be up front at the end of the service along with any available elders and leaders. If you're new, we'd love to meet you. If you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you. If you want to commit your life to Jesus, maybe for the first time you've never done that before, or recommit your life to Jesus, love to pray with you this morning. Uh, if you have any questions, we'd love to answer those questions for you. Would you stand with me? I'm going to end where we started. This is kind of the fruit. We talked about the root. Here's the fruit. And this is a doxology, a prayer from uh, Paul to the people there, but it's a prayer that also applies to us. And so as I send you out, here's the charge this morning. You can see it. In fact, it would be up on the screen right now. You can put it up on the screen. There it is. I got it. Now, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as I, we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints in Jesus' beautiful name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Love you guys.